we're having a problem here getting the projector to uh, show to the screen. So you'll just have to bear with me. Okay, if you're in Zoom, can you see the slides? You see the slides that should have the inflammatory breast cancer slide? Yes. Can you hear me? Is anybody out there? Yes, yes, everybody can see it, everybody can hear it. The problem is that nobody in the classroom can see the slides. So, okay. Um, so, okay. Just everybody bear with me while we try and get this thing fixed. You know, I don't know what happened. Let me turn it.
unmute and start the video. Okay, so we got it fixed. Everybody can see it now. No, Zoom class tell me they can't see it. So, <laughs> so okay, we're gonna pick up with this. Uh, this is where we stopped the other day. Let me uh, get the big screen. Now, a couple of points on inflammatory breast cancer that I, I didn't mention the other day. This is really serious, uh, serious type of cancer. By the time you get to this point, see these lesions here are caused by cancer cells that block the lymphatic ducts that are underneath the surface of the skin. And so then they, they, they cause this swelling and then the, the swellings become inflamed and that's what you have here. By the time you're at this uh, part of uh, uh, inflammatory breast cancer, it's already stage three. And, it, and you can see it has metastasized, it has moved to the axillary lymph nodes up there uh, in the armpit. So this, it, the prognosis for this, this type of cancer is never good because it takes a long time to find what it is. So it, it's not fatal. I mean, it, it can be treated. I mean, stage three is not you know, a, a terminal condition. Even stage four wouldn't necessarily be considered a terminal condition because of um, how far it's spread. The problem when it, with inflammatory breast cancer is that you don't know until you start seeing these lesions in the surface, what's going on. And that's what all these other little red spots here are. They're blocked blood vessels. They're blocked lymphatic ducts underneath the, the, the skin. And there's, it's causing the swelling in the in, inflammatory, you know, the term inflammatory the inflammatory response, which is normally a good thing for us. We'll talk more about that a little later on. Our inflammatory response is, is, is normally a good thing. Consider a cut or a scratch on your skin and it turns red. That's a good thing. It means it's healing. It means that there's blood going there. Uh, there's extra nutrients going there. There's more oxygen going there and lots of white cells going there. If we have a much larger inflammatory response, that's not necessarily a good thing. So. Okay, let's move on. Breast cancers, for some reason, half of them occur in the upper outside quadrant. We don't know why. 50% of them are gonna show up on the, side, on the area closest to the axillary lymph nodes. Now, does that mean that the cancer started somewhere else and migrated to the breast or did it what usually happens is it starts in the, um, the, the uh, lactoferrous duct, uh, in the epithelial cells of the lactoferrous duct, and then migrates to the, to the lymph nodes, to the, to the axillary lymph nodes. So why is it the upper outside quadrant of the breast? We don't know. Uh, the, low, the inside, the lower inside quadrant is only 6%. How come, you know, the, how come the number is so low there? Again, we don't know. We don't know what the connection is. It was, it was thought for a while that um, antiperspirants were, were triggering it because antiperspirants um, contain aluminum salts. Uh, and so when you put on a, you know, uh, a deodorant and antiperspirant, you not only are you masking any body odors, but you're also plugging the pores with the aluminum salts. Well, that line of research, uh, didn't find anything. There's no connection. We can still put on our antiperspirants and our deodorants, so we don't stink. Um, but there was a thought that because we were, you know, it's nearest the axillary nodes, but it doesn't. That isn't that isn't the problem. It isn't the the, the aluminum salts there. So, okay, self examinations. This is encouraged, um, you know, for anyone. Uh, you know, here for a breast self-examination, palpating the breast, squeezing the nipple, uh, rotating around uh, in a, a flat circular pattern to try and detect a lump. You know, males have to examine their breasts too. Males have to examine the testicles for uh, uh, a lump there. Uh, self-examination is usually the very first line of defense to detect something that's not supposed to be there. Uh, the, the problem is that the smallest that uh, we can detect by hand is usually something the size of a BB or bigger. Um, and so anything smaller than that is gonna be missed. Mammogram though, on the other hand, mammogram does a remarkable job 
getting down to something the size of a, of a period on the end of a sentence. So a very tiny, tiny lump uh, can be detected. It's recommended this be done every month, you know, a monthly exam, because breast cancers, while they can be fast growers, uh, usually a month is, you know, from, from nothing to a lump that's growing, um, you're still within a safe time frame. So a monthly exam is, is highly recommended for uh, people. So mammograms, they're the gold standard. Mammograms are, um, you know, it's a very focused type of x-ray uh, that um, if your patient is, is 40 or over, then they should have it every year. And um, there was concern that um, maybe we're exposing people to too much radiation because of a yearly x-ray exam uh, of the breast. Uh, don't know. You know, it's a 10 year difference here. It has to do with your lifetime dose of radiation. You know, so uh, the longer you delay, the less radiation you get exposed to, but the longer you delay, the more likely you are. Well, no, that's not, that's not true. The more likely you are to miss detecting something if it's there, if you wait till you're 50. So the mammogram um, is, is simply a, a very modified x-ray uh, of the breast looking for density in the breast. The, um, we know that x-rays aren't great on soft tissue. You know, soft tissue doesn't show up well at all. Uh, if you look at the, the picture of the normal breast there in the bottom left, you're not going to, you can't make out anything at all. However, tumors tend to show up very well on, on x-ray, on this, this type of x-ray as a dense tissue, but so does uh, fibers, uh, dense fibers. So do um, calcif you know, calcified milk glands. So the, this isn't going to tell you you have a cancer. It's going to tell your patient that they've got something that they have there. Now, your, your uh, pathologist, your radiologist can look at this and say, well, I don't think it is a cancer. I think it's something else. But the definitive answer is always going to be with a biopsy, a needle biopsy. Go in and take a sample of it and see if, it's, if the cells are carcinogenic or not. You know, that, that's the definitive answer. What you're betting on with the radiologist is his or her's experience in looking at these for years and saying, well, this is what cancer uh, a tumor looks like, as opposed to this, what, this is what uh, calcification uh, looks like. So, and here we see that, but we do see with a tumor, we see a dense mass, a dense localized mass. We also see, we, can, we also have a better view of a lot of the fibrous tissue uh, in here. The, uh, now, if you, if you ever had a mammogram, you know that this picture here is heavily staged because um, the mammogram is not that general process of just laying that, that uh, plastic tray on top of the breast and the x-ray plates underneath. It's more of a slam it down hard. Well, not hard, you, because how you help, yeah, you're not going to get the whole image of the breast if you're just placing it on top like that. Because look at the picture back here, you're seeing the whole breast. I mean, you can even see the nipple right there on this one. And I guess you can sort of see it there too. Um, so it is, it is a, from what my wife tells me, it's a, an uncomfortable procedure of placing this down because you got to get the breast to lay out as flat as it can so they can get a complete image of the breast. You know, there are much more uncomfortable exams that, that, that we can all experience. So it's, uh, and it's uncomfortable. I, I would imagine it's uncomfortable for a little while. Um, she never complains about it. She just says it's uncomfortable. So, um, but this is what your, your uh, mammogram will show up. You can see dense fibrous tissue here. That's not cancerous. Here are lymph nodes that are showing up through the, um, you know, through, through the mammogram from the axillary region. They look perfectly normal. They're small. Um, you know, we're, the, the average lymph node is about the size of a, uh, a bean. 
maybe. Um, so they're not very big. And even the, even the other ones are even smaller there. They're, yeah, what lymph nodes do is <clears throat> when we generate interstitial fluid, interstitial fluid is the plasma in our blood it, that leaks out. Our blood vessels, as we're gonna see shortly, our blood vessels are really leaky. They got lots and lots of holes in them. And so our plasma leaks out and becomes the fluid around our cells. That fluid around our cells is collected uh, in, a, in a parallel circulatory system called the lymphatic system. And they're, they're just a bunch of vessels that bring the, the interstitial fluid back to the, to the blood as plasma. But before that, it has to pass through the lymph nodes. And the lymph nodes are where the, the interstitial fluid is examined. Of course, we call it lymphatic fluid now. It's plasma, it's in the interstitial fluid, it's lymphatic fluid, it's plasma, it's still salt water. But if there's anything of a pathogenic nature, any bad things in the, that were picked up around the cells, it's going to be discovered in the lymph nodes. And then they're going to start the first line of our defense. Our white cells like to hang out in the lymph nodes to kill things. That's what they do. We have, in fact, we have one type of white cells called natural killer cells. That all they do is kill things, you know, pathogens. And so if the, if the lymph nodes were enlarged, that would suggest that something's going on. So here we see, no, no, stop it. That's not what we wanted to go to yet. Here we go. There we go. Now, look at the size of the lymph nodes. We have a tumor, a very defined tumor, very defined mass at number at the number three position. Of course, the breast is uh, highlighted by number two. The lymph nodes are all larger than normal. They should be they should be half that size. So uh, something is going on. But the giveaway is the tumor itself is always is is always very well defined in its shape. It's not irregular. I mean, well, the cells are irregular. But the collection of the cells that form the tumor are very well defined. So, whereas um, if you have calcification, you're going to have clusters of little dense material around the area. You know, um, my wife has some calcification in her right breast, and they put a metal clip in about four years ago. So every time they do a mammogram on her, it'll show up on the mammogram and they'll know exactly what they're looking at. It's the same thing that they see every year. What they look now for is to see if it changes instead of getting excited and saying, oh, what's that? You know, so like they did the first time. Uh, the biopsy, she had a biopsy uh, and it uh, over at um, LeConte or at the, at the um, uh, breast center and it came back as calcified uh, epithelial cells and that was fine. But they leave a clip in there, that a metal clip that always triggers the alarm at Walmart when we go through too. By the way, yeah, really? So it really does. Every time we go through the the garden center doors, it ding ding. You know, yes. so uh, <laughs> yeah, you know. Um, anyway, um, the uh, the clip there tells them what's what's what that spot is, and so now they're not looking at the spot and saying what is it. Now they're looking at to see if it changes. Um, because the, the, the tumor will be a dense mass. And that's where you're, you know, this, is, this one's easier to, for a pathologist to look at and say, well, there's something wrong here. Uh, again, the definitive uh, uh, examination would be a biopsy. But this is pretty good as far as saying we think there's something going on. So, look. And again, tumors, you know, they're denser than the area around it. We see a lot of fibrous tissue in both of these breasts. Uh, and it, but the, the, the tumor is denser. Now, mammograms are great, but you have always have problems because everybody's breasts are different sizes. Uh, a woman who is uh, of a, a small stature with small breasts uh, may have a hard time pressing that, getting it pressed down on the plate. A woman with lots of fibrous tissue in her breasts has a hard time um, uh, getting uh, the breast examined. Because again, it resists that, you know, the, the you got to get it to lay flat on, on the plate and it resists that, that, that pressure because tissue 
has a little bit of strength to it. So it's, it's not, some women will say, oh, it's nothing. And others will say, well, it's uncomfortable because, you know, uh, they'll say, well, my breasts aren't very big and I got lots of fibrous connective tissue and it is painful. So it, um, but this, this is still the gold standard. I mean, that tumor, either one of those tumors may not yet be at the size that you could detect uh, with, with self-examination. So, okay. Now, PET scans are also really, really good uh, to detect breast cancers. Uh, PET scans, one of the things we find about cancer cells is that cancer cells suck up a lot of glucose. And the glucose can show up on the PET scan. You know, um, there's been a lot of uh, thought that if you could limit the glucose supply going to cancer cells, you could kill the cancer cells. <clears throat> but what we see here, you know, there's nothing abnormal in the kidneys. Now the kidneys are, uh, let's see if I can. Okay. See, I've waited till 10 o'clock before I started playing with this, with the marker. So these are the kidneys here and here, and there are the ureters down to the urinary bladder. That's normal. That's what you would expect to see in a PET scan because that's where the, the, the glucose uh, and the dye have gone. They've gone to the kidneys to, to get filtered out. What you're seeing though up here, this is the breast cancer right there. Now, um, is there some suspicious uh, growth? I mean, look, it's a, it looks like a very large tumor growing in the breast. We have some suspicious bright areas here and here in the lymph nodes along in what we call the mediastinum, the middle of the uh, thoracic cavity. We also see something suspicious up here, maybe the cervical lymph nodes, because uh, they're pretty lit up too in here. So we, it looks like we may have some um, uh, uh, met metastatic action where the you know, metastas when a cell, when a cancer cell metastasizes, it means it's, it's breaking off others. You know, it has undergone mitosis. It's sending out daughter cells to go into other areas. So I'm a little suspicious of these two areas here um, in the media sign, but this area here, it looks like the cervical lymph nodes are, are lighting up too. So, uh, or maybe it's just because they swallowed a big dose of sugar water and the sugar still, you know, it re resin is still in their mouth. But you definitely see that this is a large tumor in here. I mean, consider, consider the size, you know, the, consider, these are the kidneys down here. Consider the size of the kidney. The kidney fits in the palm of your hand. And uh, if you look at this mass here, it looks pretty big. Okay. Yeah. Biopsy is an excellent way to uh, have this have the breast examined. Uh, it's a needle biopsy. It's usually guided right in with ultrasound. Uh, not unlike how we do it for the prostate exam. You uh, use a needle. This is the simplest approach. You use a needle, insert it into the breast, insert it into the tumor, draw out some samples, and then have them examined by a pathologist. So in fact, uh, over at the breast center, they have special tables for examining, the, uh, for doing breast biopsies. It's a table with a, an opening uh, where the, the patient lays face down and the breast goes through the opening and they can get it from underneath. So it uh, makes it, you know, it's, it's a lot, you know, well, first, you know, because if, if, if you're laying on your back, the breast is going to sag back and it's going to move around. But if it's laying, if you're laying face down and the breast is you know, through this opening, it's suspended. It's an easier way to get to this. Um, um, and plus your patient's not going to see you do it. And while some people like to watch procedures, uh, some people don't. So um, anyway, this is the simplest approach and it's very definitive. You take out a few uh, uh, tissue samples with the needle. Uh, it leaves no mark uh, when it comes out or at least a mark you can't see. 
and you're good to go. Now, the other approach is what's known as an open biopsy, where you actually make an incision and take out a larger piece of tissue. Sometimes you take out the whole lump uh, in here. And uh, here we see you know, uh, normal tissue, a tumor over here. We could come in from underneath, we could come in this way, or if it's gonna be uh, um, an open biopsy, you can make an incision anywhere along here and remove the whole structure. Yeah. This is the open uh, biopsy. You slice out either a section of it or just take out the, the lump and enough tissue around there to make sure you've caught all the cells. And the scar that's left behind is, is minimal. I mean, you can bear, if I didn't have the arrow there, you likely wouldn't notice uh, the scar. Uh, it is not a disfiguring procedure. And, and the term, when I say disfiguring, that means a lot to, to, to some people. You know, it, it means uh, if, they, you know, if they have their breast removed, it, there's a lot of psychological um, pain over that for, for, for some women too, you know, it, uh, and it's understandable. So, now, breast cancer treatment. Up until the 70s, it was the, the, the absolute gold standard uh, term that gets kicked around a lot was the radical mastectomy where you took out the breast, the muscles underneath the breast, the connective tissue and all the lymph nodes. You went, took everything out all the way up on the side. Since then, that's been rethought as, as to its effectiveness. <clears throat> the lumpectomy only takes out the cancer and, and the cells around it. So you're just taking out a chunk of, of, uh, of breast uh, and then the breast heals up. And especially if it's, if it's caught early on, uh, that's, that's always a, a good possibility. The simple mastectomy only takes out the breast tissue it may leave the skin intact and takes out some of the axillary lymph nodes. So, and this isn't even considering, you know, the benefits of radiation and chemotherapy and, and stuff like that. You know, the one thing a surgeon will always tell you is that, well, you can treat it or you can remove it. And so you have, you know, your patient has, has got lots of options here. Uh, radiation is very effective and, and very precise. Uh, chemotherapy is very good. There are some, usually some uncomfortable side effects of chemotherapy. Um, surgery works if it gets everything. That's, that's the other consideration. You gotta get everything, you gotta get every cell. So usually if, you, if your patient has surgery, she'll follow up or he'll follow up with radiation and chemo uh, unless, it's, unless it's so, you know, unless it's such a good uh, surgical removal, maybe the tumor is so small, you take it out with a lump and you got it all. So now, so this is what's known as the skin sparing mastectomy because procedures are taking into, into consideration um, the psychological impact of this. Uh, you make a keyhole cut around the nipple and you take out the tissue underneath all the glandular tissue uh, where the tumor might be located, where the tumor is located and up into the lymph nodes, but you leave the skin behind so you can have uh, an implant put in, you know, a breast implant. So that this, is, this is probably the least of the, of the disfiguring procedures here. I mean, a lumpectomy is the best, but this, this leaves, uh, uh, makes it easier to, um, you know, go with a, a prosthetic device or just insert a, you know, what do they use for in breast implants? It's uh, uh, saline in, in, in uh, I'll just say plastic bags. You know, it's probably, probably a little more specific than just a plastic bag. It's not like a Ziploc bag filled with salt water, but it's, it's the same principle. Um, but this, this is uh, the, 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 um, if, if, we, if you have to take out a lot of tissue, this is probably the best approach. Now, total mastectomy, the simple mastectomy, you take out the breast, you take out, uh, take out the skin, take off the breast, 
um, take off all the lymph nodes uh, all the way up along in here. So all the axillary lymph nodes, because you don't know if the cancer cells are spread to the lymph nodes. And it's not so much we're concerned about the lymph nodes becoming cancerous, but the lymph nodes lead to the whole body. So because the lymph nodes, remember all that plasma that became interstitial fluid, that became lymphatic fluid is going through the lymph nodes. And if the lymph nodes contain cancer cells, then those cancer cells are gonna get a free ride back into the blood and then they can be spread anywhere. So this is why we take out the lymph nodes because we wanna get rid of any cancer cells that are caught there uh, by the white cells. But a simple mastectomy, you end up with a scar uh, on one side or both sides. Um, and you know, essentially the whole breast is removed. Uh, the radical mastectomy goes all the way down uh, to the uh, level of the ribs. Uh, we've got uh, the, pector the pectoral muscles are taken off too. So we're down to the ribs here. We get all the lymph nodes uh, all the way around. We take out all the fat, uh, you know, everything is gone because this is, you know, we're, we're, you know it, maybe it's an aggressive tumor. Maybe it is uh, got multiple places within the breast where it's growing. Uh, maybe the uh, lymph nodes are all uh, affected. So, and there's all sorts of modifications on this. Uh, you know, you can, uh, it depends. It just depends on the, the nature of the cancer. Is it a slow grower? Is it a fast grower? Is surgery the only option? Is uh, radiation a better option? Uh, I will say that the radiation procedures now are, are much more precise than they ever used to be. You know, when you consider 50 years ago, breast cancer, uh, many people viewed it as a, as, a, as a killer, as a death sentence, you know, because you'd treat it and it would come back and your patient would die. And, and that's not the case now. This is what the scars look like. Uh, you can see that those are the staple marks, those little red uh, little puncture marks. That's where the staples were put in. So that your patient has um, had both breasts removed and you can see probably down to the level of uh, the ribs because you can see the ribs underneath the skin, the um, uh, pectoralis muscles, the, the pecs have probably been taken off here. Uh, it's a trade-off. So I had a, a friend in Virginia that uh, she, her family uh, had breast cancer running in their family, which we know that you know, they, they were genetically predisposed to breast cancer. So when her sister got breast cancer, she decided to go ahead and have both her breasts removed and go on chemotherapy. Uh, and her doctor went along with it and she had both breasts removed and uh, she did fine. And then she died from some other cancer that came along. So it, uh, she didn't get breast cancer because she had them removed, but it was just- um, So they just like removed her breast and found- Yeah, you know, you know, it's, um, she wanted to do it. She said there was a family risk. The, her doctor went along with it and, um, she had them taken off. So, um, but the, this, is, this is what your patient can expect to see afterwards, after the surgery. You know, um, a, a flat, uh, a flat uh, chest, uh, chest wall, the breast is gone. Uh, the cancer's gone with it. So, and your, your patient can use uh, some sort of prosthetic device Obviously, if, it's, if there is uh, skin sparing, then you have a place to put a saline insert so it looks more real. Because again, it, there's a lot of psychological issues here with having uh, you know, uh, the, the breast removed. Yeah, my cousin had to do that. She's still, like it's been five years and she's still a little like very insecure. I mean, oh yeah, she yeah. She hasn't had, you know, because you have to have somebody take care of you. And, you know, when you do Oh yeah, like yeah, that, so. you know, it's, it's um, a lot of your, your, your emotional makeup is, is, is your appearance. And, you know, to have that, um, have that suddenly and drastically changed is, is quite a shock uh, to the system, you know. Um, 
you know, my, my friend in Virginia that had it done, I mean, she was, uh, we used to say that she was goofy before, she was still goofy afterwards. I mean, she was funny, she did think she, she had no appearance of any kind of emotional change. And we went to church with her, so we knew her pretty well. But uh, you don't know what we weren't seeing. Yeah, you know. people usually have their relationships. So. Oh, yeah. And I, I, you know, of course, I moved down here in 2004, and she died somewhere around 2010. Never heard any, you know, didn't know about that. So, so I don't know what, how she reacted to the, to the new cancer coming back, you know. So perhaps she was focusing on the, on the wrong genetic predisposition. So it was, it was, it was, it was sad. So, okay. Total mastectomy. One side removed, the other one not. Uh, you can see that, um, you know, the, um, the you know, here we're taking out a lot of fat cells and the nipple and the areola. Uh, the one on the right-hand side could be a, a good candidate for uh, implants, you know. Um, it, uh, but that's something that, uh, and, and, and the only reason I, I'm, I, I keep talking about this is you're, if you're in healthcare with your talking to your patients, they're going to want to talk to somebody that seems to understand uh, and underst understand you understand the situation better. Um, and whether you know you've had breast cancer or not, if if it's if you're talking to your patient, they need to understand that um, what they the decision they made was a good decision, and that they can feel good about themselves because you know. Um, this this can be for some people a real as you said a real blow uh to to their emotional makeup is a total mastectomy the surgery that would be used um say when a woman don't transgender and she wants a breast removed but they do that same operation or is it different it's probably the same thing uh, uh if, a, if a woman is trying to transition um uh, yeah the breast reduction uh they would they may leave the, the uh, skin behind on the surface uh, or, uh, or not, you know, but that would be the, the reduction, you know. And of course, lots of women that are, uh, that, can, that feel like they're too large will also have reductions, just they'll take out the, you know, uh, some of the fat tissue. So it's not like the, the milk production is necessary, uh, is the only way to feed a baby. You know, lots of people, you know, uh, our lots of babies are formula raised, um, and you know, and and even if you only take out part of the the lactoferrous tissue and the fat, it's still possible to, to you know, breastfeed if that if if that's what the woman's thinking of. Yeah, you know? but yeah, that's that's the same type of procedure. So anyway, okay. Now let's talk about. Female sexual response. You know, we talked about how the male response is. You know, this is a parasympathetic response, just like in the male. The parasympathetic nervous system, which is normally our rest and digest and, and, and defecate and repair and maintenance system, is also the sexual arousal system in both males and females. Uh, the parasympathetic nervous system uses the neurotransmitter acetylcholine and it causes the release of nitric oxide to cause blood vessels to dilate. Well, in the case of the female, what we're getting is dilation of the blood vessels in the nipples, in the uh, clitoris, uh, in the uh, labia major and the labia minor. So um, everything becomes, in the, the clitoris, the, the vagina, and the breasts all become engorged with blood because we're increasing the flow, uh, we're, we're causing a, a release of, of nitric oxide from the cells that are underneath the lining of the blood vessels. You know, nitric oxide is our body's own vasodilator, you know, causing blood vessels to enlarge. So the parasympathetic system causes that to occur. The vessels dilate, and it, in a sense, this is perfect for the parasympathetic system because parasympathetic is rest and digest. So these vessels relax and they get bigger when they relax and more blood goes through. So uh, at the same time, 
the vestibular glands, the glands around the vestibule secrete a lot of mucus to lubricate. Uh, and the constant stimulus of the clitoris is uh, going to, uh, you know, again, uh, the glands of the clitoris is, is equivalent to the glands of the penis. Both are 10,000 times more sensitive to touch than any other part of the body. And that constant uh, touch will stimulate mechanoreceptors, which will, uh, the, the touch receptors, and it will eventually lead to an orgasm. And when, that's where the sympathetic nervous system uh, takes over. Because now at orgasm in the female, we get the, the muscles tighten up, the heart rate goes up, the blood pressure goes up, blood vessels are narrowing, and there is a series of contractions of the uterus. So, you know, uh, the, the male has smooth muscle contractions to cause the ejaculation to occur. In the female, the, the, the counterpart contractions are the, the uterus and the vagina are contracting outward. Uh, so the the period of orgasm uh, is, is the counterpart to the uh, uh, orgasm in, in, in the male. The stimulus of the clitoris doesn't necessarily require uh, penetration into the vagina. Because if you remember your anatomy, the clitoris is at the top of the, at the anterior end of the um, uh, labia minor, the vaginal orifice is about a, an inch and a half down from there. Penetration goes up into the vagina. Uh, stimulus of the clitoris indirectly from penetration will, will cause arousal, but direct stimulation, you know, it's not going to be a direct stimulation. So uh, it, it isn't necessarily dependent on the um, uh, penis entering the, the, uh, the vagina. Now, something else, many people believe that they can't get pregnant if they didn't have an orgasm. You know, believe it or not, yes. Yeah, I know you're like, what? You know, <laughs> yeah. But yes, uh, lots of people will insist uh, that, you know, uh, that they didn't come, so therefore there's no chance of getting pregnant. They did, you know, the woman says, I didn't have an orgasm. How can I get pregnant? Well, you know, that not even part of the discussion, you know, <laughs> um, it, uh, but that is, as I said, orgasm is not essential for conception to occur. If the timing is right and penetration is successful, and an adequate number of sperm and semen uh, are released, and there's a um, there's a viable egg up in the ampulla. When the sperm gets there, chances are you know there's a there's a better chance there than having no penetration whatsoever. So anyway, but yes, I, it, it is amazing that some people still that that people will people believe that. So. So the female sexual response is triggered by um, slightly different, um, uh, uh, what's something we're looking for? Um, triggers, I'll say triggers again, than the male. Um, the, um, in the female sexual response, it is touch and psychological thoughts. You know, uh, it can be um, a buildup of desire, it can be touch, it can be this, it's not the constant, you know, where, uh, you know, males supposedly think of sex every seven seconds. Uh, females don't. Uh, it is, you know, the female sexual response is more driven by um, touch and, you know, the, the stimulus of being uh, in a pleasurable situation uh, here. So what happens is the clitoris enlarges. The, the second, the parasympathetic system is kicked in and releasing nitric oxide. The blood flow increases to the clitoris. It also causes the vessels to dilate, which allows the mucus glands to secrete more mucus. Um, the, the breasts get bigger, the nipples enlarge. The nipples are also erectile, but the, the female nipples will become engorged with blood and become erect. 
Uh, the vagina gets longer, it gets moist. The labia uh, major separate. The heart rate goes up. Lots of mucus being released here for lubrication. And this first phase lasts for maybe five minutes. The heart rate's up, the, uh, the breathing rate's up, the skin gets flushed, the skin gets bright red because the, you are, you know, nitric oxide is a vasodilator. So we're vasodilating all the, the blood vessels. And so we get this, this, what we call a sexual flush in here. Happens in the males too. Um, hardening of the nipples because they're getting engorged with blood. Uh, the, um, and again, the clitoris and the labia are both going to swell up. Um, now, right before orgasm, the clitoris will reach a point where it has become oversensitized. It will start growing back a little bit. Uh, the vagina swells up. The vaginal wall may turn purple. Somebody had to do all, take notes on all this stuff. You know, think about it. Um, Involuntary muscle spasms, you know, twitches, um, contractions, vocalizations, noises um, can happen during this point in time. So, uh, and then the orgasm phase, this is the shortest phase. Um, the muscle tension peaks, the pulse rate goes up, the blood pressure goes up, the uterus contracts. Uh, there is, um, more vocalizations, more muscle spasms. Um, suddenly the tension the muscles relax. Uh, the heart rate goes up. There's a large surge of um, endorphins, the uh, pleasure hormone uh, that, that gets released here. Remember endorphins uh, make you feel good. You, this is the uh, same hormone that gets released when you exercise a lot and you feel good after exercise. It's also the same hormone that gets released when you eat chocolate. So, uh, it, but it's a very, it's one of those, you know, the more you release of it, the better, the, the, the better you feel. This next, the last phase is the resolution phase. Uh, everything relaxes, blood pressure drops, um, uh, muscles relax, uh, a period of fatigue, a feeling of intimacy with, with uh, her partner. Now, something that's different between the males and females is males have a refractory period. Uh, it's time, for, it, the refractory period is the time required before a second orgasm can occur. Um, refractory period has to let the nitric oxide be uh, reabsorbed uh, before it can, uh, they can go through this procedure again now depending on the age, the refractory period in the males, maybe just a few minutes to a few weeks in older males. So, um, so uh, it, as, as the male ages, his refractory period will get longer and longer. Females don't have a refractory period. They can have multiple orgasms. They can have you know, one, two, three, four, or five, however many that can occur. They don't have to essentially reset uh, the, the parasympathetic system like the male does. I just said that. Now, what is the driver um, for uh, the um, sexual response in the female? Well, it is um, the androgens. Um, the libido, the female libido, the desire for sex is driven by the production of the androgens. Uh, in the adrenal uh, cortex. And, and one of the things that you will encounter is after menopause, you know, because, okay, menopause, the ovaries stop producing estrogen. That, we know that, the, you know, how many times have you heard me at some point throw, the, throw grandma under the bus because the postmenopausal female, you know? So I get to do it in person. I'm not gonna throw grandma under the bus for real, but at least, and you hear me, you can see me say it, you know. So postmenopausal females don't have working ovaries. They don't release a lot of estrogen, but they still have a small amount of estrogen being released as androgens 
from the adrenal cortex. Um, and many postmenopausal females, recent postmenopausal females, will often confide in their healthcare provider that their their libido, their desire for sex is greater now than it has been in years because the androgens are, are now are no longer being masked by the estrogen from the ovaries. So your, your postmenopausal female will have a greater sexual desire uh, afterwards. And of course, if they haven't had that desire for a long time and suddenly they, they have the desire is there, they're going to, what is wrong with me type of approach. And there's nothing wrong with them. That's what their body is telling them is, is doing. Um, there are some differences. Um, prior to menopause, the desire for sex in the female will usually trigger arousal. Yeah, so, um, but in um, after uh, menopause, it's the other way around. Arousal, sexual arousal will trigger desire. You know, they, they may be stimulated, you know, through thoughts or touching or, or actions or whatever, and then the desire to have sex will occur. So it's sort of reversed here. Um, so instead of having desire, you know, uh, where the female prior to menopause has desire for sex and, um, then she's then, uh, and then becomes aroused. Here, um, they're aroused, and then they decide they want to have sex. So it, it's sort of reversed. Um, the other thing is uh, that um, there are some physical changes to the uh, vagina. The vagina will become drier. Uh, the because of the, the lower levels of estrogen will cause less mucus to be released in the vagina. So um, it, um, with less mucus, it's uh, harder to, it's, it's more challenging to stimulate the uh, clitoris to, to stimulate the vagina itself. And so it does take more time for arousal to occur. So, um, you know, where, your postmenopausal female will often say that you know, uh, you know, I that nothing's happening. That's the best way I can say it, because it, the uh, or they complain of dryness and irritation, uh, and so they have to resort to some sort of you know, maybe some sort of lubricant to help them out. Uh, so it does take longer um, uh, to get to arousal which then will lead to the desire to have sex. So, because, um, you know, it's all, it's all based on the, on the lower levels of estrogen there. There's nothing wrong with them. There's something else to point out. It's nothing wrong with them. It's simply because of the lower estrogen levels that they are having. That lowers the blood supply to the vulva, to the clitoris, to the vagina, which reduces the sensitivity, which reduces the, the lubrication. And so it's... You know, it, they, they, it often may be painful too. And if something hurts, what are we gonna do? We're, we're not gonna do it, right? So if, it, if it's irritating, then there's something, you know, there are ways to, to, to fix that. Yeah, okay. Now, this is something else that we, um, you need to pay attention to with your older patients. Older patients above 50 have the, highest rate of sexually transmitted diseases in the United States, particularly in nursing homes. I don't want to think what grandma and grandpa are doing uh, at <laughs> night or during the day or in the afternoon, because apparently they're, you know, yeah, they have a lot of time in their hands. And um, can, you, can you think rabbits? Oh. You know? So uh, I've had people in nursing homes that work at nursing homes tell me that sometimes they just have to pull people off of each other. Anyway, oh my yeah, you know, <laughs> people over the age of 60 have the highest increase of STDs of any population group in the nation. You know, the, um, you consider they have herpes simplex, gonorrhea, syphilis, hepatitis B, trichomoniasis, and chlamydia 
rose 23% in that age group in three years. The rest of the population of the US, it only went up 11%. So it was double, you know, it was, it was double. <laughs> I know, it's amazing. But you're right, they have a lot of time in their hands. They are in close proximity. And if they're reasonably healthy, you know, and they're in a, an assisted living or just a retirement uh, community, you know, it, it, it happens. So the, um, I blame all the baby boomers that, that have retired and, and, you know, that grew up in the sixties and said, Oh, Hey, you know, uh, free love. Well, you know, there's now they're in the nursing home and it's, Hey, it's still free love. 60 years later, you know, so, yeah, so, um, anyway, but I mean, that is, that is probably a, a segment of the population that's involved here, so, okay, so what about these diseases that they, that they're picking up, and it's not just them, it's, it's a whole population, we're seeing a, a gradual rise here, um, I, I saw in the news the other night that something about um, uh, HIV cases uh, are rising again, too, which is sort of, um, you know, unusual. Now, granted, part of that is because um, HIV, HIV has no longer has the, um, you know, it, it, a lot of people uh, view HIV as just another sexually transmitted disease because there are some very effective treatments uh, for it than there were back in the 80s when it first popped out all over the place. So, now, sexually transmitted diseases, STI, sexually transmitted infections, the old term that you may still hear people say is venereal diseases. Uh, the same thing. We lead the world in infection rates. You know, we're number one in STDs. I don't know why. Um, condoms are a, great, are a great protection method because they form a barrier between, uh, you know, uh, between individuals so that there is no transmission of body fluids. That's where these diseases are getting spread through mucus and through saliva. Uh, the problem with the STDs is that uh, if untreated, there's at least one that will kill you uh, if you're untreated. It'll kill you 20 years later. Um, most of that, uh, several of them will cause infertility that can't be fixed, um, and others cause just some just unpleasant side effects. Uh, also, if they're viral, they never go away. There are no viral there are no viral diseases that have ever been cured. You know, there's treatments for viral diseases. Uh, there's vaccines for viral diseases, but there are essentially no viruses that have ever been cured. So now, okay. In, in, in 2016, you know, somewhere along the way, the CDC got busy and other stuff and hasn't updated their sites. Um, but chlamydia seems to be the big one now in the US. It is a bacterial disease. These are all bacterial diseases, actually. Um, 1.6 million cases of chlamydia uh, in one year, uh, about 500,000 cases of gonorrhea, and about 27,000 cases of syphilis. Uh, these are the big three bacterial infections that uh, we see rising. So chlamydia, most common bacterial uh, STD in the United States is caused by a uh, bacteria. Um, Untreated, it causes about half of all cases of pelvic inflammatory disease. The bacteria live in the oviducts. They grow, they reproduce, they form scarring as they, as they break down, they reproduce some more, and they block the oviducts. This seems to be the, the, the biggest concern here. Uh, plus, they cause inflammation in the whole pelvic area. This is, a, this is pelvic inflammatory disease. You know, th this is the classic case of a, of a pelvic inflammatory disease, not caused by endometriosis, not caused by uh, an, uh, uh, an IUD that is irritating the lining of the uterus too much, 
This is caused by the bacteria. It causes pain in the urethra. It causes discharges from the penis and from the vagina that are difficult to see because these discharges are transparent. I mean, how many people are gonna notice that, they're, that they have an, an odorless, colorless vaginal discharge or leakage from the, the uh, penis, the urethral orifice in the penis? Who's gonna notice that? Because it's clear and it doesn't smell. Um, the, the problem you're gonna see, but other symptoms include pain, uh, pain in intercourse, pain uh, in the abdomen, pain in the rectum. And the female will often have menstrual flows that are gonna be, she'll have irregular flows here, maybe four weeks apart, six weeks apart, three weeks apart. So you're gonna have, the, the, the menstrual cycle will, will be disrupted because of the presence of this uh, uh, bacteria. And most people have no symptoms. 80% of all women have no symptom of it. Um, can cause urinary tract infections in men. You know, men don't notice it either because it's going to be other than other than pain, you know, uh, in the testes uh, or maybe burning when they urinate. But you know that can be caused by anything, and <clears throat> it leads to problems during childbirth. It affects children. <clears throat> An infected mother can pass that to the baby. <clears throat> it can scar the cornea of the eye, it can cause pneumonia. And it's treated so easily. Tetracycline is an antibiotic that was really popular in the 70s and 80s to the point that everybody took it, everybody used it. And then all the bacteria developed a resistance to it and nobody used tetracycline. And now it's making it. tetracycline, the, the bacteria that was resistant to tetracycline, um, they sort of, uh, they've been overtaken by other bacteria and now tetracycline is effective again. So, because back in the 70s and 80s, if, if you took your child into the doctor and they had a sore throat, you wanted an antibiotic. It didn't matter, it was viral. You wanted your kid to have an antibiotic. So here, give me some of that tetracycline and the doctors would just give it out to essentially to make them go away because it wasn't gonna hurt them. And the problem was uh, back, if, if it was viral, antibiotics don't do anything for viral infections. Uh, antibiotics don't respond, don't treat viruses. And so it, what, it, what it would do is it would kill all the healthy bacteria. And if there were pathogenic bacteria around, they, were, they developed a resistance to the antibiotic. And then after a while, you know, by, by the, the 2000s, tetracycline didn't work on anything. So, okay. Um, Committee of rates. The Southeast are the biggest areas. Um, the um, the northeast, uh, extreme northeast, and, and West Virginia have the least amount of uh, infections there. I I don't believe West I, I don't believe that West Virginia number. I'll just let that go. Okay. Um, <laughs> these numbers are always going to be skewed because they're based on one set of numbers for the whole state. So it could be located in one city, you know, North Carolina, for example, right there, uh, right next to Tennessee, North Carolina is dark blue. They have high numbers. Now, is it because of the whole state or is it clustered around, you know, the Raleigh, Durham uh, uh, area? A lot of colleges there, a lot of universities there, a lot of people there, you know, the same with, um, how about uh, Georgia, Atlanta, and Columbia? Yeah, you got the university, you got Atlanta. What about the rest of the state? You know, so regardless of the numbers are appropriate, are, are listed for the whole state, but they've been climbing. Tennessee, um, where do we fall in here? In 2016, Tennessee had 32,000 cases, about the same we had, you know, we stayed fairly consistent right around that level there. Um, and uh, um, actually our rate per 100,000 has dropped a little bit. Alabama is, um, has, is running around, well, they dropped from 30,000 to 26,000. 
West Virginia. I just can't believe those numbers, but look at Texas though. Uh, 147,000, 42,000 cases in 2016, five years, six years ago. So, and they've been continuing to climb since then. Now, you also have to take into account, you know, cases don't mean anything. The rates per 100,000 do. You know, Texas has lower rates or about the same rate as we do, more or less. More people in Texas. Too. Yeah, so you have to look at, yeah. you have to, the number of cases, if you have 100,000 cases out of 10 million people, that's not very many. You have 100,000 cases out of 5 million people, that's a lot more. So, okay. This is what chlamydia does uh, in the mouth and in, in the eyes. Now that's an infant on the, on the right-hand side there, scarring of the cornea, the outer covering of the, the clear area of the eye. Um, also, we have scarring, we have lots of uh, bacterial growth in the mouth. You can tell this is an adult because they've got um, what looks like stainless steel um, uh, crowns in place there, or at least those are really big silver fillings. So, Does it cause like, can it cause blindness? In it can in infants, yeah, yeah. it can. It can cause blindness in babies. Now the discharge in males and females is transparent. We can't tell the difference. Um, you know, we can't tell it from any other mucus discharge from the male or the female. It doesn't stink. It doesn't have any color to it. It is transparent. So it's going to be hard to detect. Uh, but this is what happens inside. This is in the uterine tube. The bacteria is a rod-shaped bacteria. So... But in the uterine tube, we get all this kind of growth in here and all that leads to scarring. Now, what is similar to chlamydia is gonorrhea. Gonorrhea, often called the flap, um, is, um, it's again, an exposure through <coughs> mucous membrane. Uh, both of these are treated very successfully with antibiotics. Uh, the cases have dropped, but in the symptoms, at least give you a red flag. Um, in the males, it hurts to pee. The, the, uh, you have inflammation in the urethra, it hurts to pee, and there is a discharge, usually a greenish yellow discharge from, from the uh, urethra orifice. Uh, males may, females may show no signs at all, but they can also have a vaginal discharge that is greenish yellow. Uh, Again, it will grow in the um, oviduct. Uh, it will grow in the urethra of the male and can uh, block the urethra. Uh, it can block the oviduct in the female. It, it can cause infertility very easily here. Okay. Chlamydia and gonorrhea have the same types of outcomes. But gonorrhea is going to be, they're both STDs spread through bacteria. They both usually have no initial symptoms, but they're both going to cause blockages of the oviducts. Uh, the giveaway is for gonorrhea, it's going to have a greenish yellow discharge. Uh, let me get back to it like this. Uh, a very thick, creamy discharge that is sort of green. It's a little easier to spot that and what you would see with, with chlamydia's transparent discharge. You wouldn't even notice that. So, so where do we see it? Again, across the Southeast, uh, there was a spike here during World War II, a large spike here uh, in the 70s, and then it tailed off, thank you very much, and it started to rise again. Um, again, you know, uh, there's always the risk uh, of this with unprotected sex. Now, of course, that's what the discharge looks like. This is gonorrhea of the rectum. The, uh, this is a result of anal sex with uh, an infected individual. And the um, bacteria found a home in the rectum and grew there and uh, is causing scarring and twisting of the rectum. It may cause twisting of uh, the end of the, of the uh, large intestine too. Uh, probably extremely painful 
uh, defecation. Um, you know, it's it it's got to hurt because it's it's actually going to be twisting the, uh, the the tissues around. So it can grow anywhere. It can grow in the mouth. It can grow in um, the uh, urethra. It can grow in the rectum. It can obviously grow in the oviducts. But it's easily treatable with antibiotics. Now the third um, bacterial STD is syphilis, and this is the killer. Syphilis um, comes in three stages. It um, the first two stages are relatively innocuous. I mean, they cause some obvious signs, and then it then it may or may not go dormant. If it goes dormant, it will come back again in 20 years and affect the brain and the blood, the, the heart, and um, kill your patient you know, if, it, if it's untreated. It is um, characterized by a sore called a chanker. The, the first stage is, is the presence of a sore on uh, the penis or on uh, the vagina. And, uh, the second stage that show, you know, then that sore will go away. You know, your patient says, well, I had this sore on, on my penis and I put some uh, antibacterial cream on it, which actually is not a bad idea, but you know, again, it needs to be treated systemically. Uh, and it went away. And now I've got this rash that came along. What's going on here? There's a second stage characterized by a rash and that'll go away after a couple of weeks and you'll feel fine. And then they go into a latent period. Now they may stay in a latent period the rest of their lives, nothing can happen. Or they can go into a tertiary seed, uh, phase where they develop lesions that destroy the brain, destroy the heart, uh, uh, rot away the skin. So really nasty uh, appearances here. And um, again, all this is treatable. This is, you know, syphilis is a bacterial disease. It is not a viral disease. You know, viral diseases can't be treated, but bacterial can. Um, viral diseases can be, you, you can treat the symptoms. Bacterial diseases, you can destroy the bacteria with antibiotics. Okay, so big spike uh, at World War II, a smaller spike here. Um, don't know why uh, in the early 90s, there's a very large spike here. And that spike dropped after World War II. You know, penicillin came out by the, in, in the 1940s. So people that came back from World War II that uh, had uh, acquired syphilis um, from wherever they were, uh, were treated and it went away. Yeah, but now it's, it is uh, coming back again. It was a very up until the antibiotics uh, were developed, it was a, a major problem. So this is what the chanker sore looks like, the lesion there on the glands of the penis right there. And here, um, right below the vestibule, there's a large lesion right there uh, on the female. So this, but this goes away. Whether there's any treatment or not, it goes away. Secondary lesions and, and rashes show up on the skin, on the feet. You know, here's a secondary lesion on the penis, uh, all, you know, a rash all over the body, all over the face. You know, this is a secondary lesion here. Once it gets to the face, when is it treated? Like that bad? Um, it, it's still treatable. It's still, treat it's still treatable. Um, you know, this is a severe rash, but it's still treatable, but it's when it goes into the latent period and then comes back is when it, uh, it is going to kill your patients, you know, um, you know, it, it rots away your bone, it rots away your skin, it damages your heart, um, you know, uh, she's still alive in this picture, by the way, look at her eyes, she's still alive, um, yeah, uh, it, 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 it doesn't go back at that point so and it could have been treated it could have been treated very easily um because yeah. the initial symptoms unfortunately go away after a couple weeks now trichomoniasis this is one that you can actually smell the, its presence um this is easily treatable uh it is a uh, a protozoan 
infection. It's, it's not a fungus, but protozoans are little microscopic animals and um, they infect uh, the vaginal tract of the female. Uh, you get a very powerful greenish yellow discharge that smells badly. You, know, you can, um, you can smell, the, smell the result of this. And the area around the, the labia will have these little spots here. They call them strawberry spots because if you look at those red spots, it almost looks like what a strawberry looks like. You know, just a little bit of imagination here. But the odor uh, is, is very, very powerful, very strong, unpleasant odor is, is the giveaway too in this. But again, it's treatable. There are lots of antifungals and you know, dr drugs that will work in this and, and cure it. So, genital warts. Human papillomavirus causes this. Uh, same virus that causes uh, uterine cancer, I mean, cervical cancer. Um, they look like little cauliflowers that, uh, you know, if you've ever had a wart on your skin or ever seen a wart, uh, a little, it's a little, you know, usually a white or gray bump, and then it goes away. It's caused by a virus. Um, genital warts will appear usually around the uh, labia, uh, around the, uh, the, the penis, uh, anywhere in, in, in the groin area in here. Uh, it is uncomfortable. It causes you know, like a lot of, let's say, itching um, and um, just general discomfort very painful intercourse, a lot of bleeding as the, the, the genital warts are pushed and shoved. Um, the, 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 the thing is that genital warts do not cause cervical cancer. It's the same virus, uh, but um, the, uh, most of the, most of the um, variations of uh, human papillomavirus cause these warts and not cervical cancer. However, it's very easily spread from partner to partner. Uh, in here. And it looks like, they look like this. You know, here we have warts on the shaft of the penis. Uh, and here we have warts growing on the labia. You know, and they're very uncomfortable, I would imagine. You know, uh, and, and th this, oh, come on, stop it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I didn't mean to zoom in on that. Let's, uh, hang on a second. Uh, there we go. See the the links in these pictures are still still live. So uh, now there we go. That's the one. Those are genital warts. Now, how did someone let it get this bad? You know. You don't wake up one day and say, hey, where'd that come from? That yeah. is disgusting. It is disgusting, you know. Um, Maybe homeless, I mean, that's all I can say. Well, it could be. Because, <laughs> you know, and, and you know, there is, there is a real powerful mindset of, well, if I ignore it, it'll go away. You know, a lot of people still think that. A lot of people are afraid to go to their doctor. Or maybe they don't have a doctor to go to, you know. So, uh, but this has got to hurt. You know, it's just pain. It's painful to look at. So, okay. Oh, question. Uh, comment. Um, yeah, it. I should have warned everybody about that. that. Was bad. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, there should have been a disclaimer coming up. Maybe in the maybe the next time I do it, I'll have a disclaimer. Okay. <laughs> Genital herpes. Genital herpes. Two types of the virus that causes herpes. Herpes simplex virus. Herpes simplex virus one is what shows up in cold sores. You, know, you get a cold, you know, you get stressed. Uh, you uh, put some of that uh, herpesin or whatever the medication is on it, and it goes away. The virus lives, if it could live, the virus exists inside the nerve endings on either side of your mouth. It moves up the, the axons of the nerve endings of the nerves and lives there. Um, when you become stressed, it migrates to the surface of the skin and causes inflammation and pain and swelling and unpleasantness. Um, 
herpes simplex one will show up if um, in the genital area if uh, your patients have engaged in oral sex. And we see a lot of cases of herpes simplex one, uh, the, uh, the sore, the genital sores showing up uh, around the uh, labia on the penis, uh, particularly in younger patients, middle school age patients, believe it or not, yeah, that, you know, that, uh, that don't believe that oral sex is sex. So, uh, and so there, there's, a, there's a real spike in uh, uh, the herpes simplex numbers there. HSV2 is, the, is what we would consider the uh, genital herpes that shows up um, you know, on uh, the labia, on the vagina, on the penis, but it's also showing up around the mouth now, again, because of oral sex. Uh, they are both very contagious, uh, spread easily. Uh, most of us probably have HSV1 living inside our uh, uh, a nerve in, in our mouth, because most of us will get a, you know, probably 80% or more of the population is infected with HSV1, the, the stress virus, if you will. Um, the population that has HSV2 is much less. What are the triggers? Well, you know, we know that when we get stressed, there, there's a type one cold sore right there. Um, and We've all had them. Usually, I get mine in the corner of my mouth, and they're uh, uncomfortable. Um, but 25% or more of the population has HSV2 at our carriers. It isn't always prevalent. Um, it shows up when there's stress. It shows up during sex. It shows up when you're exposed to sunlight. Really bizarre things can trigger uh, a herpes, the, the HSV2 outbreak. You can treat it with uh, antivirals, which will minimize its outbreak and take the time down to, from 14 days to two or three, um, and then it goes away. So, but uh, general herpes is highly contagious. Uh, again, this is what the, uh, you know, we see the sores and inflammation here on the penis and over here uh, on the labia and in the area of the vestibule. So very painful intercourse, um, you know, it, um, but, and the triggers are bizarre. Like I said, you know, uh, exposure to bright sunlight can suddenly trigger that. So these are not distress herpes. So, and that is the end of repro. I, I went a little long and I wanted to finish up today. We got started late. We got started late. Yeah. Um, yes, today, is cow day. I have five hearts that are uh, chilling right now. And um, I'm, I plan on bringing three of those out uh, for today's lab and two for tomorrow's lab. So uh, yes, so we're definitely having, having the cow hearts today. So they were delivered yesterday. So they're fr they were fresh yesterday morning. So. Okay, so I'm gonna, get us out of here and um